This is how you can trim branches quickly and easily. Trimming branches used to be hard and time-consuming, but not anymore. This mini chainsaw is the perfect tool for cutting smaller trees and branches. Powered by cable. Washington Journal continues. Will Pomerantz is at our table this morning. He's the director of the Kennan Institute at the Wilson Center, here to talk about the six-month anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You were with us six months ago, the morning of uh, that in invasion. Where do things stand on the battlefield? Well, on the battlefield, we are in a stalemate, essentially. And what's interesting is that after six months, neither side has the manpower or the ability to win this war. And we are now faced with a war of attrition, and we will just have to wait and see who eventually gains the upper hand. And it is not clear as to who or when that will happen. Who has momentum? I think the Ukrainians have momentum because they're defending their country, and they have a idea and a cause that they're fighting for. The Russians, according to reports, have just been thrown into the battlefield. They haven't been really briefed as to why they're there. Uh, they have suffered significant casualties, and it is unclear whether they actually have the ability to win this war or to take significant and hold about, uh, territory. How do you win or lose a war of attrition? Um, you just have to make sure that you're there. Um, and again, we've had wars of attrition in history. Uh, World War I was a war of attrition. Uh, the Civil War in the United States was a war of attrition. And it just required the will, the political will, to stay the course. And you don't know when you will get the break or when the other side will collapse or fall apart. Um, and it is uncertain. And that is where we are right now in this war. Where is Russia vulnerable on a war of, of attrition? What we've learned is that Russia is vulnerable because it doesn't have the troops and the, and the, the will and the understanding as to why they are trying to take Ukraine. Putin has made various sorts of announcements about Ukraine being filled with Nazis and genocide, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, none of this is true. And therefore, Russians don't really know why they're fighting. Now, some kind of have long understanding of Russia as an imperial power. Some think that Ukraine has always belonged to Russia, and therefore it should be a part of, of the Russian Federation. Uh, but that has not been articulated really well by President Putin. And in light of the casualties and the economic consequences, it is uncertain how long the Russian people will stay the course. They might stay for a very long time. And Putin has various sorts of ways to make sure that that happens. Uh, there has been a dramatic increase in repression, in crimes that will allow for imprisonment if you uh, declare that you're against the war. Uh, these are the things that Putin has used to make sure that not only he stays in power, but there really isn't no no, there's no opposition or protests. What about soldiers returning from the battlefield? There's reporting that soldiers in U Russian soldiers in Ukraine are seeing how well Ukrainians were living and were surprised. Well, I think there were quote one of the reporting was one woman that they had kidnapped had two bathrooms and they were so surprised by that. Well, I, I don't think that Ukraine's standard of living is significantly better than the Russian standard of living. Uh, both countries have suffered as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union and trying to create a market economy. Uh, I don't know what apartments or places that they were visiting, these Russians, yeah. uh, but if they indeed felt that they were, that the Ukrainians are better placed and are, have a better standard of living, uh, that is similar to the fact, to the, to the situation during the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union's collapse when Russians and Soviets were able to visit the West. They realized, you know, despite 70 plus years of socialism, they were not living as well as people in Western Europe and the United States. What are Ukraine's vulnerabilities in a war of attrition? Ukraine's vulnerabilities is that it also will maybe will not have enough people. Uh, they have imposed a draft. Uh, men cannot leave Ukraine. Uh, so that 
the ability to put people in, into, into the field, to have the artillery, and you talked about that in the previous uh, segment, about the United States sending more weapons to Ukraine, um, that is a vulnerability as well. Um, but there are a host of other vulnerabilities. Um, one is the Ukrainian economy and that they can't export grain. Uh, another is the fact that Russia is playing with fire uh, with this nuclear power station. And that, you know, we only need one stray missile, as it were, uh, and not only Ukraine, but depending on where the wind is blowing, everybody else is in a whole lot of trouble because of this war. In the UN Security Council meeting yesterday, the UN uh, diplomats calling for demilitarization of this nuclear power plant. What do you think is going to happen next? Well, I, we can only hope that the Russians uh, pull back. Uh, the Russians have basically said that the Ukrainians are firing at this nuclear power plant. But the available evidence so far suggests that it's the Russians who are making the attack on the uh, Zaporozhna power, uh, nuclear power plant. I should add that when the Russians took over Chernobyl, um, they began digging ditches and making defensive uh, movements around uh, Chernobyl in the dead zone where no one has been able to live or even farm or whatever for years. So again, one will have to see how Russians have deal with that crisis because obviously a lot of Russian soldiers were exposed to radiation during the occupation of Chernobyl. Well, talk about the dynamic of the car bomb that uh, happened in, in Moscow, um, killing the daughter of a Putin ally. W what's the fallout of, of that? Well, the fallout is that they blamed Ukraine. Um, they don't really have convincing evidence of that at all. But I think uh, Russia will try to use this assassination or killing uh, to increase their violence and attack on Ukraine. Whether they can succeed, whether, you know, that, that they have, as I said, the manpower to do that is, is questionable. But clearly, going after the daughter of the main philosophical uh, proponent of Eurasianism and the war uh, in Ukraine uh, was, um, was a very uh, significant act. And we just don't know what the fallout will be. We heard, forward. we heard in our first hour from several callers on, on a couple of things. One, Russia's, uh, they claim Russia has, uh, Russia has the rights to Ukraine because of history. Can you talk about that a little bit? And then the second is that um, Ukraine is corrupt. Well, Russia does not have the right to Ukraine. Uh, Russia and the Russian Empire throughout its hundred years history made sure to repress Ukraine and the Ukrainian language. So when Putin rolls out his 18th century maps and says, look, there's no Ukraine there, uh, there's a reason. And that is because that the Russian Empire and the various czars made sure that the, Russia, the Ukrainian language was suppressed. Um, Ukrainian identity only really emerged uh, in the beginning of the, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. But it is a member of the United Nations. It has been a member of the United Nations since its founding. Uh, Russia recognized its borders after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, it has been a nation for the past 30 plus years. And the fact that, you know, Russia still believes that it has an imperial right to Ukraine uh, suggests that Russia's imperial way of thinking has not disappeared even after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Second comment we heard was that Ukraine is corrupt, it has been corrupt, it's currently corrupt, and that, you know, these weapons and this money that it's people, the countries are giving to Ukraine um, is not worth it because of history of corruption. There has been significant corruption throughout the Ukraine uh, throughout Ukraine's independence. Uh, it has been a perennial problem. 
there have been various attempts to fix or deal with corruption. Um, it has been very difficult to get rid of. Uh, even when President Biden came into office, when they were discussing the ent potential entry of Ukraine into NATO, uh, Biden said that they c couldn't consider it until Ukraine ended its corruption, which essentially said that Biden wasn't going to support Ukraine's entry into NATO. Um, so it's a perennial problem. Uh, there are various anti-corruption strategies that are at work in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine suffers from a variety of defects, uh, most notably, or one of them, is that there was a large Russian population in, uh, the, in Ukraine, and several of the oligarchs in Ukraine had direct uh, relations with Putin. So it has been, it is a complicated process. No one has an exact model as to how Ukraine goes from a part of the Soviet Union to a independent democratic nation. Um, no one suspected that it would become, it would do that rapidly. Uh, and Ukraine has suffered uh, from a, for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, from corruption, and that has delayed its economic development as well. Let's hear from our viewers this morning. Ruth in California, Independent. Hi, Ruth. Hi, good morning. Um, my question is, do the Russian people know the uh, fatality rate? Are they receiving the bodies of their sons uh, I presume most of the soldiers are sons uh, back to Russia. And do they know how bad it is? Yeah, Ruth, let me just jump in because according to Ukraine, Moscow's casualties are close to 45,400. Well, the Ukraine, the Kiev's, Kiev's army chief has provided what seems to be the first public tally of uh, military deaths for that country, and it's nearly 9,000. Yes. Um, I don't know exactly if we can trust all those statistics. Yeah. The other statistic that was recently put forward was that the Russians have suffered up to 70,000 casualties, uh, which would be a tremendous blow for the Russian military. Uh, they have not, Russia has not released its casualty rate. Uh, basically, uh, there have been various sorts of rumors that, you know, they had mobile crematoriums so that they were able to dispose of the bodies, both the Russians and Ukrainians, uh, during the battle. And it will be very interesting to see when uh, Russian mothers, particularly mothers, the, realize that this is killing their sons. It was uh, notable in the Chechen war in the late 1990s that Russian mothers, uh, the soldiers' mothers, um, was a very strong opposition force in the Russian Federation to this war and were known to go actually to the front and get their kids and send them home. Uh, now that bespeaks some of the problems of the early, uh, of the Yeltsin era, but um, I think that when Russians learn about the rates of casualties, uh, not just Russians, but also Ukrainians, um, there will be political consequences. Uh, Brian in Massachusetts, Republican. Brian, good morning in Massachusetts. Oh, thank you. Thank you, C-SPAN. Um, you, you had a great show. I'd like to uh, mention a couple things, uh, and I'd like to, um, Mr. Pomerantz uh, to um, comment on them. Um, aside from um, Babi Yar in um, Ukraine, uh, if you speak to a Ukrainian and Russian, they understand you. And not one person in the United States should want to have their son or spend money, blood and money, 
for uh, this war between the two of them. We don't need this. And anyway, um, I'd like to hear what uh, Mr. Pomerantz has to say. Okay, about Brian. That. Right. So uh, I think the, the major question is, is Ukrainian and Russian the same language? And they're not. And I can safely say that having been in Ukraine, um, I don't necessarily understand all of Ukrainian, but I do understand Russian. Um, the idea that somehow, you know, they are joined, that these two nations are joined, um, has been put forward by Putin. That's one of his arguments for the war. Um, but in fact, again, Ukraine has its own history, its own language, uh, its own uh, religious organizations. And so the fact that Russia and U Russia has asserted that Ukraine and Ukrainian and Russian are the same language or very similar is simply not the case. And um, in terms of not spending more money on the war, I think the United States has played a very important role once this war has started to make sure that Ukraine has the ability to, fend, to defend its country and its inter territorial integrity. And I think we have not volunteered U.S. troops to go to Ukraine. I don't think that's in the cards at all. But Ukraine has really stepped up and basically created a first-rate army uh, that is deterring the Russian Federation. And I think that in the beginning of this war, most people doubted that that would be the case. Mike, Crescent City, Florida, Independent. Hi, Mike. Hi. Hey, look, it is my understanding that when this war started, we froze $100 million in Russian assets, which we now control. So why aren't we using that money in this war in Ukraine instead of hard-earned taxpayers' money? We have people sleeping in the streets. Food banks are running out of food. But we got all this money. Now, why aren't we using this money we have from Russia frozen? The, Would you answer that question, please? The money is frozen, but it's Russia's money. And so we have not decided to use that money for the defense of Ukraine or for uh, arming the Ukrainian uh, people. Uh, but it was a major blow and a major surprise that the United States and the West was able to freeze hundreds of millions and billions of dollars in Western banks. Uh, that was one of the slush funds that Putin had, and he, I don't think he really understood that the banks could freeze it and that they would actually do that in cooperation uh, and make sure that Russia doesn't have access to these funds. Dan in Waynesboro, Georgia, Republican. Good morning to you, Dan. Good morning, Greta. How you doing? Doing fine. Your question or comment here? Uh, yes, I just wanted to say that, you know, Putin is a problem and he's always been a problem of the world. And uh, for Ukraine, the people, if the United States doesn't help them, who in the world will help them? So, you know, it's like the Ukrainian people are held hostage and it's just a senseless war. And uh, I just hope y'all have a great day. Thanks. Um, I do want to emphasize that in addition to the United States and its support, the Europeans have made significant uh, requests for aid to Ukraine. And indeed, one can argue that the Europeans and the, had, have suffered the greater economic harm during this war than the United States. Moreover, going forward, uh, if indeed Russia stops its deliveries of gas to Europe, it is Europe this winter that will suffer the most. So yes, the United States has played a major role in this war uh, and has basically led, for the most part, the response to Ukraine. Uh, one should also consider that the allies of the United States, especially the Europeans, have played a significant role as well. We'll go to Humble, Texas. Thomas, Independent. Your question or comment here, Thomas. Hey, William, how you doing? 
Hey, listen, what main concern should be the meltdown of the, um, well, if the cooling system goes off in the plant, it's going to be a meltdown. But I was talking about the history of Ukraine. Was it part of the Ottoman Empire? And uh, as far as Putin is concerned, I would be scared to death if somebody got that close to uh, blowing up or killing one of his closest allies. It might be inside job. Thank you. Parts of Ukraine, of, of t present day Ukraine, were a part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, I think Putin is very cognizant of his security. Uh, we've seen various pictures of Putin discussing uh, the events in Ukraine with his advisors, where Putin is 30 feet away at one edge of the table and his advisors are huddled back at the other end. Uh, Putin, I think, will, has always been concerned about his security, and I think that he has been very careful not to expose himself um, during this crisis. Linda in New York, Republican. Hi, Linda. Hi. Um, my comment and question is about economic retaliation. Uh, two points. Um, I watch television and I put things together. Now, one thing is Putin's been buying up gold mines, and so he can control the gold production in mm -hmm. Russia. Could he possibly retaliate against our sanctions and put Russian rubles on the gold standard? The second point is, prior to all this happening, um, China officials got together with Russian officials, just as Hitler and the Russian officials got together before World War II. So I was worried they might be cooking up something. And I know China owns a lot of our treasury bonds, and we are in debt. Could they call them in at the same time as Russia goes on the gold standard and put our dollar in question, which is not on the gold standard, and just on the full faith and credit or the goodwill of the American people to work to produce goods that the world will buy? So I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Well, I haven't really followed the question of Putin and setting Russia onto the gold, uh, gold standard. Um, I think there is the possibility that Russia and China will coordinate going forward, uh, both militarily and economically. The question for Russia during in, in that sort of co collaboration is that Russia is already, from an economic standpoint, the junior partner f with China. And if Russia has to depend on China even more going fur further, it will limit its sovereignty and its ability to be a global player. So the, the economy is, is, a, is a major concern both for China and for Russia. Uh, there have been various discussions about how Russia is sending more gas and oil to China, although at a discounted rate. Uh, but no doubt that if indeed this crisis escalates, there is the possibility that China and Russia will f even f form an even greater, uh, not, not alliance, but cooperation uh, in terms of the economy. Alex, Silver Spring, Maryland, Democratic caller. Good morning to you. Hi, good morning. Uh, I had a brief question, and then I'll have a follow-up after that. Um, do you happen to know a uh, Russian scholar by the name of Nikolai Petro by any chance? Um, not off the top of my head. Oh, uh, all right. Well, it's all right. He, he's my dad, so I, I like to plug him every so often. Um, but <laughs> I don't think he, you, you would agree with some of the analysis that he's had. Um, as far as that goes, one of the things that I would like to comment on is uh, this conflict has, in some form or fashion, been really going on since 2014, of course, when the Maidan revolution happened and um, the separatists started breaking off and uh, causing an internal conflict there. Um, so my personal argument would be that if we're talking about uh, Ukrainians uh, and Ukrainian identity and Ukrainians defending themselves, part of the 
talk that we're not having is um, who are the Ukrainians that we're talking about? Because it should be argued that there were some Ukrainians who were Ukrainians before 2014 fighting in Luhansk and Donetsk oblasts and um, were fighting for their understanding of what a Ukrainian identity is. And the government came down hard against that identity because it wanted to create the Ukrainian government, I should say, wanted to create its own independent identity separate from Russia. And so that's part of what is being fought over by Ukrainians and that the Russians in intervening in the conflict as they have, have sided with one version of Ukrainian identity over another one. And uh, in America, so in sending weapons and money is falling down on the other side of that okay. identity argument. All right, Alex. Well, the question of Ukrainian identity is a very complex one. And there are Ukrainians who are Russian speakers. There are Ukrainians who are Ukrainian speakers. Uh, they are Ukrainians who understand both Russia, Russian and Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukrainian. Um, basically, the Donetsk, the two regions, uh, uh, Luhansk and Donetsk, that Russia attacked after the uh, 2014 Maidan and Revolution of Dignity, um, they were primarily Russian speakers. Uh, and that was what the Russians tried to capitalize on when they entered into uh, the uh, Donbass uh, and declared these, these areas independent. Uh, they initially did not declare them as independent states, and they definitely did not declare them as a part of the Russian Federation. So what we are discovering going forward is that this is in fact a war not of, it's not a frozen conflict. It is a conflict where Russia is attempting to annex various territories and bring them back into the Russian Federation. And so this is the conflict or part of the conflict that is going on right now in the Donbass. And the Ukrainians have insisted that the Donbass based on the territory uh, that after the collapse of the Soviet Union is a part of Ukraine. And so this is what they are fighting for. Um, but I think going forward, the issue would be, is Russia going to annex these territories? Uh, and what will Ukraine's response be? Because obviously from a Ukrainian standpoint, it cannot suffer uh, a loss of territory uh, and remain, as it were, a, a really viable nation. Will Pomerantz is our guest. He's the director of the Kennan uh, Institute at the Wilson Center, here to talk about the six-month anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We'll to go, go to Catherine next in Concord, New Hampshire, Independent. Hi, Catherine. Good morning. I have a question about the Ruthenians. My friend was born in America, but her parents fled to America just before World War II. And we've been friends since the 50s, and any time I refer to her as Ukrainian, she gets so irate. And she talks about how the Ukrainians were so terrible to us, meaning the Ruthenians. And I assumed that that went back to her parents growing up at the beginning of the 20th century. How are the Ruthenians involved now? Are they, because I know they're on the Western side, and I was wondering, how are they pro-Russian or are they pro-modern Ukraine, when you talk about the identity of modern Ukraine? I haven't followed the uh, expressions of the Ruthenians uh, during this war. Uh, but as you said, they're in the western part of Ukraine, and the western part is really the most nationalistic part of Ukraine. Now, the Ruthenians have asserted their own identity over in the past and have basically tried to assert at times that, you know, that they deserve some sort of nationhood or recognition. 
but I don't think that that is in the cards right now. Uh, this, uh, all of Ukraine is a patchwork of various different nationalities. Uh, finding a Ukrainian uh, identity has been very difficult uh, over the past 30 plus years and throughout history. But I think that uh, the that, that Ukraine uh, has basically said that you know the Ukrainians are part of Ukraine, and that will that that is where things stand at at the present day. Don's in Virginia, Centerville, Virginia, Democratic caller. Yes. Good morning. In battle, you when they're fighting, they quit fighting. They tell the truce or peace agreement during battle, why, why is this being done in Ukraine? That's my question. I'm wondering. You have to answer. Well, no one has actually agreed to a truce. Uh, no one knows what the terms would be, and no one has stepped up to enforce a truce. So essentially, uh, both President Putin and President Zelensky um, have basically said that they're in it for victory. What victory means for each side is different. But there is no real indication that some sort of ceasefire or truce is in the cards uh, because of the stakes of the conflict and that the stakes are so high for both of these leaders. And both of them don't want to be perceived as backing down in this conflict. What does victory look like for Russia? I think victory in Russia uh, there are various sort of scenarios for victory in Russia. Uh, initially, I think Putin thought that he, it would be a mad dash to Kiev. Powered by cable. just before World War II. And we've been friends since the 50s, and any time I refer to her as Ukrainian, she gets so irate, and she talks. I haven't followed the uh, expressions of the Ukrainians uh, during very difficult uh, over the past. Being done in Ukraine, that's my question. I'm wondering, you have to answer. Well, no one has actually agreed to a truce. Uh, no one knows what the terms wish to. I'm wondering, you have to answer. Well, no one has actually agreed to a truce. Uh, no one knows what the terms would be, and no one has stepped up to enforce a truce. So essentially, uh, both President Putin and President Zelensky um, have basically said that they're in it for victory. What victory means for each side is different, but there is no real indication that some sort of ceasefire or truce is in the cards uh, because of the stakes of the conflict and that the stakes are so high for both of these leaders. And both of them don't want to be perceived as backing down in this conflict. What does victory look like for Russia? I think victory in Russia uh, there are various sort of, sort of scenarios for victory in Russia. Uh, initially, I think Putin thought that he would be a mad dash to Kiev and to other Ukrainian cities, uh, that they would be welcomed by, as, as liberators, and that Ukraine would really be no more. And it would just be part of the Russian Federation, and the sense of Ukrainian identity would disappear. Uh, that did not happen. Um, and so it's unclear what victory now looks like for Vladimir Putin, there is the possibility that he could just say, you know, we've gained control of the Donbass. That was what we wanted. Uh, they are now part of the Russian Federation. We have won. Uh, for the Ukrainians, uh, I think victory means uh, Russia leaving Ukrainian soil. Uh, Ukraine being that, that Crimea and the Donbass are returned to Ukraine. Um, and that is not, um, that will take a long time in the, on the battlefield at least for that to uh, ensue. So for Russia, I think gaining control of Ukraine is its ultimate objective. For Ukraine, 
uh, gaining control of the territory that it has lost is its ultimate objective. And there is real, really no kind of middle ground or truce in, in the offing at the present time uh, that can uh, achieve that. Jim's in Michigan, independent. Question or comment, Jim? Hello. Morning. Hello. Good morning. Uh, I guess you're hearing me? We are. Go right. ahead. Okay. I'm very nervous. I did take some notes ahead of time, and some of these might seem a little ancient, but um, are you familiar with uh, a book by a man named Neil Asterson? Asterson, yes. The title of the book is called Black Sea? Yes. Okay. So then you can could, you could make it easier for me and explain how uh, before the Greeks, before the time of Christ being recorded, uh, the Scythians were around the Black Sea. The Russians were north, and they, actually, I get a little excited about this, but it seems to be the historians of much of the world seem to ignore that the genetic birthplace of uh, Ukrainians was Siberia, as are uh, uh, some Poles, Latvians, Estonians, uh, other Arctic Russian peoples, names that I can't describe, um, are not Caucasian. Um, they certainly do look Caucasian. They, they aspire to be the, of the West, and you could say in many ways they're more Western than the West, okay? And um, they seem to be uh, ignoring that those peoples who came from China's wall uh, 20,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, uh, are different people than Russians for a long time, and it ain't going to change, okay? Well, th um, it's been a long time since I read this book, so I can't exactly go into all the details that you described. But obviously, this is a part of the world where multiple nationalities have lived and have ruled. And Everyone is competing at some point for this history, uh, but I can safely say that the Russians are not part of that initial history, that it's really kind of at the end of the uh, 18th and 19th century that Russia becomes a Black Sea power, um, and that it is, it, is, it is a question as to um, how Russia maintains its hold on the Black Sea. Now, Russia, during, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the Black Sea Fleet remained in Crimea, uh, and the Russians essentially had a lot of control over the Black Sea Fleet. Um, now, in light of the uh, war, uh, it, is a, it is the question of whether Russia will maintain its influence on, over the Black Sea. Um, or whether Ukraine can also be a Black Sea power. And I think that is a question that is still to be determined. Michael from South Carolina sends us this text this morning. Winter seems an obvious important factor coming up. Is there anything we as U.S. citizens can do to help the Ukraine people thrive through this winter to their advantage? Well, I think obviously helping Ukraine during uh, during the war will, will, will be a significant part of U.S. support. But obviously, any s effort to make sure that Ukraine has sufficient energy resources uh, to get through the winter will be very important. Indeed, that will be very important for uh, the Europeans as well. Uh, so winter is coming, uh, and that will be a very important variable in this war. Uh, and whether, you know, Russia decides to weaponize its energy, whether Ukraine is able to secure other resources to maintain uh, its energy independence are very big variables going forward. Doug in Falls Church, Virginia, Republican. Hi there. Uh, thank you for taking my call. And uh, I'm a big fan of C-SPAN, so thank you all for, for having this discussion. Uh, I had a couple of comments and a question. Um, I've heard some callers previously on, on C-SPAN in general kind of um, weary of the war, almost showing support for, for Putin. I, I think it's really important that the Americans as a whole show a lot of resolve in our support for the Ukrainians. 
and we think about Russian meddling in our elections. We think about uh, Russian support for Assad and people like that. You know, the, all the uh, bounties potentially put on American soldiers' head and just Russians kind of cavalier assassination of, of nationals uh, abroad. And that we really uh, send a message in, in Ukraine. Um, also, I, it, I, my other kind of common question is, is almost related to that previous text. Um, I, I, I'm, you know, a Republican, very supportive of how Putin's been conducting things generally overall. But one thing I, I wonder is, I think we need to view this as more of like a full-scale war on our part. I wonder why we're not doing more at home to uh, save gas, to make sure that we can send LNG over to Russia to support them. Um, also, r- related to China, China has been showing their unwavering support to Russia in general on an international stage as well as individually. At what point should we start to have some of these sanctions or do more to weaken China, buy less from China in general? And, then, and I guess my, my, my question in the end would be, um, I've heard a lot of people talk about Putin's position and how it's, you know, despite all the things going against him in Ukraine, how he seems to be well in power. What, what, what in your eyes would it take to actually cause Putin to have a fall from grace and be forced to step down? All Thank right. you for taking my call. Okay, so that's a, that's a <laughs> lot there. there. Um, the United States and its commitment to the war. Uh, the question of Ukraine fatigue has been raised many times during uh, the, independ- the, the, the life of, the, of independent Ukraine. Uh, I do think I agree with the caller that we do need to have resolve and to help Ukraine for a variety of reasons uh, to get through this war and make sure that it, re- it retains its independence and its territorial integrity. Um, in terms of kind of making it a full-scale war, that is a very interesting question because President Putin has not made this a full-scale war. He has called this a special military operation and has not, therefore, called up uh, the military uh, or basically sent kind of all of the resources of Russia into this battle. So Russia itself has been reluctant to declare this a war, uh, and there has been pressure uh, on Putin to basically do so and therefore increase the manpower and the resources and send in the National Guard, et cetera, et cetera, so that it actually has the resources to win this war. Um, In terms of China, I think the United States has focused on the question of Russia, and I don't think the United States is willing to uh, make this a global war. Uh, There are other issues that are involved in that, but um, I think the United States, from a diplomatic point, the diplomatic standpoint, has not wanted to impose sanctions on on China. That being case, Chinese companies have reportedly been more reluctant to deal with Russian companies because they don't want to get caught up into the sanctions regime. I don't have uh, as more anecdotal evidence uh, than actual uh, um, statistical data, but that that is uh, one of the issues involved as well. Finally, what will it take to uh, remove President Putin from power? Uh, that is a million-dollar question. Um, I would like to think that a military defeat and economic collapse, which is possible uh, after, dur- dur- during this war, uh, would put even more pressure on Putin. But as I said earlier, Putin has been very careful to make sure that he has power and the ability to repress any sort of dissent within the Russian Federation. Uh, and so it will be a very brave Russian people who decide Uh, that they can no longer tolerate the current war and the ramifications of that war. Uh, But when when that will be and what will be the catalyst to put the Russians onto the streets is still unclear. Will Pomerantz, thank you again this morning for the conversation. My pleasure. 
We'll take a break. When we come back, we're going to switch gears and focus on campaign 2022. It's Jessica Taylor from the Cook Political Report will be here to talk about key Senate and governor's races to watch in the fall midterm elections. We'll be right back. Thank you.